December 2nd, 2001, was a cold, snowy day in Lea, a village in the European country of Georgia. Fifty kilometers to the east, among the trees along a nearly impassable mountain road, three men were out searching for firewood. It was getting dark when they happened across a bizarre sight. Two small cylinders that, despite the snowfall, were perfectly uncovered. In fact, underneath each container was a circle of soggy ground that was steaming. It was too late to turn back, so they decided to spend the night in the forest using these curious objects as personal heaters. Soon afterwards, all three men would end up in hospitals for up to two years, and one man never left. This is the true story of the radiological accident in Leah, Georgia. In the early 1980s, the country of Georgia was well on its way to producing the vast majority of its electricity via hydroelectric dams. The Kodoni Dam was under construction, waiting to be connected by radio relay stations to the Nguri Dam a few dozen kilometers away. This remote effort wouldn't have any reliable access to electricity, so in 1983, the Soviet Union, of which Georgia was a member, manufactured eight radioisotope thermoelectric generators, or RTGs, vessels that carry extremely radioactive sources that can generate electricity through radioactive decay alone. These were to power the remote relay stations. But before the RTGs could be installed, Georgian independence and the fall of the Soviet Union intervened. The Kodoni Dam was temporarily abandoned, as were the eight sources of incredible radiation. Of the eight Soviet RTGs, two are lost to this day. Two were recovered in 1998 without incident, two more in 1999, again safely. The remaining two RTGs were found in 2001, not by soldiers or specialists, but by three men looking to stay warm in the snow-covered forests 50 kilometers east of Lea. December 2nd, 2001. Three Leah men were driving their truck in mountainous terrain made nearly impassable by snowfall. Near the end of the day, their quest for firewood had led them to something out of place. Two metal cylinders laying on the path in front of them. Unlike the surrounding woods, the ground around these cylinders was snow-free and steaming. Whatever was creating the steam and the heat was invisible. It was around 6 p.m., and it was getting dark. Rather than make the many-hour trek back to Leah, the three men decided to make camp in the forest and use the curious cylinders as personal heaters to make it through what would be a frigid night. One man picked up a cylinder and dropped it immediately. It was too hot to touch and confusingly heavy for its small size. Instead of abandoning the abandoned devices, the men fashioned a thick wire into something that could move the cylinders without touching them dragged them to a rocky outcrop that would serve as camp, and lit a fire. The next few hours were uneventful. The men ate dinner and drank vodka, their backs to and touching the Soviet RTGs still radiating what was to them an unexplainable but beneficial amount of heat. Three hours later, they all started vomiting. Their stomachs, combined with nausea, dizziness, and headaches, would make for a terrible night's sleep. The next morning, they were exhausted and loaded up only half the firewood they had gathered into their truck. Still not concerned with the invisible heat from the cylinders, two of the men made holders to carry them on their backs for hours as they worked. But the men eventually decided to leave the cylinders behind. They navigated the treacherous roads and returned home to Leah. Their symptoms persisted for days, but the men told no one. It wasn't until three weeks later, on the 22nd of December, that their families told the local police about their declining conditions. All three men were hospitalized the same day. A radioisotope thermoelectric generator is a relatively simple piece of nuclear technology. It only needs two things, a source of radioactivity like plutonium and a way to turn decay heat into electricity. Invented in 1954, 
An RTG uses technology called a thermocouple that, with a difference in temperature across it, generates electricity. It's not a lot of power, but with no moving parts and long fuel half-lives, RTGs are perfect for remote or extreme environments that only need small outputs for very long periods of time. Most RTGs are on spacecraft or in remote areas like the Arctic. The Soviet Union used RTGs filled with strontium-90 to power uncrewed lighthouses and navigational beacons all across its territory. But when the Union collapsed in 1991, it left behind approximately 1,000 RTGs, most without protection or warning signs. Many of them are still unaccounted for today. A little over a year after the cylinders were first discovered, while the anonymous men were still being treated in hospitals, the International Atomic Energy Agency answered the Georgian government's request for help in recovering what were now known to be two abandoned Soviet RTGs. And they got everything on video. This incredible footage, shot by the IAEA in 2002, captures the training that prepared the participants for recovery, the recovery of the RTGs, and the medical consequences of using strontium-90 as a personal space heater. Most stories like this are never shown in this detail publicly, so consider the footage throughout the rest of this video invaluable in both its rarity and its ability to show you how to successfully deal with a radiological incident and its aftermath. By late January 2002, the IAEA had visited the site, examined the overexposed wood gatherers, and come up with a plan build a special 5.5 ton lead transport container to hold the two radioactive sources, manufacture tools specific for the operation and its location, adapt an old army truck to move the special container, and train 26 individuals and 26 backups in the proper recovery of radioactive sources. This training would be critical, as the RTGs and the strontium-90 inside were so hot that no individual would be allowed to spend more than 40 seconds near them during the entire mission. This was non-negotiable. A whole body dose of five sieverts brings with it a 50% chance of death. The radiation emitted at the surface of the sources was almost five sieverts per hour. Recovery officially began after IAEA scouting of the area on the 2nd of February, 2002. The 18 kilometers the recovery team traveled from a nearby village was a slog of mud, snow, and unmaintained roads that took three and a half hours to navigate. The path was only passable with the help of a towing tractor provided by local authorities. The agency wanted to avoid these harsh conditions and leave the isolated canisters alone until the spring where they wouldn't be hurting anybody, but fear from the local population and the government of Georgia pressed them forward. Once on site, the mission would last just an hour, thanks to the strict adherence to the two critical principles of nuclear safety. Nuclear physics is complicated, but personal nuclear safety is extremely simple. TDS, time distance shielding. Whatever a source is emitting, it's constant. So the less time you spend near it, the less dose you're going to receive. Radioactivity, like light, spreads out in every direction and decreases rapidly with distance, so every meter you're from it matters. Finally, radiation can be attenuated or outright stopped as it passes through matter, so get anything between you and a source. The least time, the most distance, and the most shielding will keep you as safe as possible if you must be near a radioactive source. Simple rules, but powerful. The first time I heard about this principle, was from a man who used it to photograph the elephant's foot beneath the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. The second principle of nuclear safety is ALARA, or as low as reasonably achievable. If you have to work with radiation, you endeavor to do all you can through TDS to receive the lowest dose achievable for the work. You don't linger, you don't take chances, you don't do anything that you don't absolutely have to. This is why you see the IAEA-trained workers here literally running away from the sources. When working with something that hot, every meter and every second counts. Once everything was in place, once the calculations were done, the lead container prepped, 
and the movements of workers according to dose limits planned, recovery commenced. The following is the actual footage of the operation. Listen to the workers call out time limits. Point out shielding they can use. Stay behind the rock. Hear the ticking radiation counters. Get away, not done, he's gonna run on. Run this way! This Come way! This way! This way! Notice the steam coming from the sources, still hot enough to melt the surrounding snow. Within just 20 minutes, both sources were contained, an excellent example of how to recover a dangerous orphan source quickly and with severely limited financial and technical resources. No recovery worker received more than 1.16 millisieverts of radiation, less than 10% of the dose you'd get from a CT scan. The mission was a great success, but the three men who first found the abandoned generators were not so lucky. After they were hospitalized in the December of 2001, the three Lea men, now patients, would be moved around hospitals in Georgia, Russia, and France, and would receive extensive treatment. Patient three was the luckiest. He received burns on his legs and hands, but was discharged after only a month of treatment. Patients one and two would need treatment for up to two years. A full body dose of 10 grays, another unit of absorbed ionizing dose, is 99% fatal. A dose of six grays is lethal for 50% of those that receive it, and 5% of people will die after receiving two grays. Patients one and two had received estimated doses between one and six grays, meaning that any road to recovery could be impassable. Most people know that radiation poisoning can kill, but many aren't aware of just how sinister the not immediately fatal damages can be. Radiation breaks things down on an atomic level, most notably DNA, and changes to the DNA of a cell can lead to cancer, mutation, or impaired function. White blood cells don't fight off infection because they all died off. Wounds don't heal. Case in point, radiation lesions on patient one's back simply refuse to close, rejecting continuous treatment and multiple extensive skin grafts. The normal healing pathways were destroyed. Lesions on his back where he sat against the abandoned RTG would get better, then worse, then much worse. Patient one died from multiple organ failure and cardiac arrest after 893 excruciating days. Patient two went through a similar hell with a radiation lesion on his back that defied treatment for nearly 500 days. Thankfully, patient two finally recovered enough to be discharged from the hospital on March 18, 2003, and returned home to Georgia. A self-contained radioactive source that is no longer under proper regulatory control and poses an immediate radiological threat is called an orphan source. They can be anything from an abandoned RTG to a medical imaging device to a nuclear warhead. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission has estimated that at least one device like this becomes an orphan source in the United States every day. The improper handling or control of orphan sources has directly killed people all over the world and caused many millions of dollars in damages. The identification of orphan sources and their collection is therefore critical to any country's comprehensive nuclear safety program. In 2003, the same year patient two was finally discharged from the hospital, the IAEA went back to Georgia, looking for more orphan sources just in case. And they found another 300 of them. Until next time.